All righty, we have here a 74-year-old gentleman uh, with a history of end-stage renal disease. He's already on dialysis through a right IJ tunnel di dialysis catheter. Today, we will be uh, creating an AV fistula using the Lipsis device. Um, before we get started, uh, I'm going to review the anatomy just to make sure that uh, the initial vein mapping that we had done uh, still holds. So I'm going to start with the outflow vessel which uh, is usually what I like to do. This is the cephalic vein right in the middle of the screen. And you can also see a collateral right next to it as well. But the cephalic vein appears to be nice and big. And uh, this is me coming down all the way to the elbow. This is the median cubital. And uh, also I'm going to look at the basilic vein, which is right here, again in the middle of the screen. Can I get some more gel? So the basilic vein also appears to have a good outflow over here. So he has had a more detailed vein mapping. This is just right at the time of our uh, procedure. OK, so uh, once again, uh, now I'm going to look at the inflow. So for the inflow, we look at the brachial artery. The brachial artery is actually flanked by two of the brachial veins, the medial and the lateral, and you can uh, see the, uh, the nerve bundle on top of it as well. So if you scan down, you will see the brachial artery at one point split into the radial there you go. This is the brachial artery. You will see it split into the radial and the ulnar. So the ulnar dips down while the radial stays on top. Okay, finally, now I'm going to look at the perforator vein. So this is the median cubital. As I scan down, you will see the perforator come off it and start coming down towards the radial artery. So I'm going to go back and forth just so that you can get an idea. On the right-hand side is the radial artery, and the left-hand side is the perforator vein. And as I go back up, you will see the, uh, the proximal radial merge with the ulnar and become the brachial. And you see the perforator go, get superficial until it joins the median cubital right here. Okay, so the main thing to look at right now is uh, the, the sizes of these vessels. We want these vessels to be at least two millimeters or more um, at the point of uh, anastomosis, which is right here. We want the radial artery to be at least two millimeters or more. And uh, of course, uh, we want to be sure that, uh, uh, and this has been done during the vein mapping to make sure that the patient has good ulnar flow as well in case something happens to the radial artery. So uh, having looked at all of these things, the patient appears to be a good candidate. And now we will get started. Okay, I'm poking into the vein. I have a flashback. And here you will see the tip of the needle. Now, at this point, what I did was exactly the same thing that I had done earlier, go back and forth. I'm just going to go down the vein. And as I'm scanning down just a millimeter at a time, I will advance the needle as well so that the tip of my needle is always visible. Now, as I'm doing this, you will notice that the radial artery is also coming into view. So as I'm scanning down, I'm advancing the needle. And uh, here you will see the I'm right next to the radial artery. So if I move the needle, 
to the right, I can actually poke into the radial artery. So you can either do it this way uh, in a transverse view, or what I like to do is look at it in the longitudinal view. So in the longitudinal view, you can see the needle in the perforator vein. And as you scan towards the radial artery, the radial artery comes into view. So I'm going to go back and forth, needle, needle tip, radial artery. So radial artery, needle tip. My needle tip is a little bit high. So now at this point, I'm going to start walking my needle tip towards the radial artery. Staying in the perforator vein, but you can actually see my needle tip in view, poking the radial artery. And once I think that I'm kind of in the center of the radial artery, I'm going to poke into it. And I think I'm in. I have a good arterial flow. The wire flows freely into the radial artery. I'm scanning down towards the wrist and all the way down the wire has tracked. Now at this point, this is an 018 wire. I'm gonna exchange it for a six French Terumo sheath. Light a uh, heparin please. So at this point, once my wire is in the artery, this is the time to give heparin. I generally will give 2,000 units of heparin. <clears throat> you want to hear the heart rate? Heparin to heparin? Uh, just to the catheter. So I'm going to advance the sheath. So my sheath now just protrudes a little bit into the artery. Now at this point, I'm gonna exchange the 018 wire for an 014 wire. Because the ellipsis device goes over the 014 wire. So my wire is going well down into the radial artery and my sheath, as you can see, the tip of my sheath is right there in the radial artery. So at this point, um, the orientation of the device is important because now once I've passed the device through the sheath, the device is actually sitting in the radial artery. So now right under the arrow you, is where the crossing point is. So I'm gonna start pulling the device out and with that, the sheath is also going to be coming out a little bit because I want the sheath to be in the perforator vein. Now the device is going to come into view. And at this point, you see the tug of the tissue. So the orientation is important because this is where the device actually catches the inside, the endothelium of the artery. Now, once you feel this tug, 
this is when you lock the device. When you lock the device, what it does, it clamps the artery and the perforator vein together. So here we have the device nicely logged. As you can see with a gentle tug, it's, it's pulling the tissue. So I know that the, uh, the tissue is logged within the device. Okay, so uh, what is the distance? So the distance is about 0.3, which is good. It doesn't look like there's a whole lot of tissue in between. So uh, we'll get activated now. We'll activate the device. The device goes through three cycles of heating and cooling. Now, the idea is to hold neutral pressure. You don't pull on it. You don't push on it, just neutral pressure until it's gone through its three cycles. Okay, so the three cycles are up. At this time, the device is freed up by itself. So I'm going to now pull the device out. Uh, grab the sheet for me. And we'll exchange this for a five millimeter balloon. So immediately after the angioplasty, or uh, the creation of the anastomosis, we go ahead and angioplasty uh, the anastomosis. So this is fistula flow. Okay, so right across the anastomosis is where I'm going to angioplasty. Go. So this is a five millimeter by two centimeter balloon. You can actually see the anastomosis and the constriction over there. Okay, let's hold it for a minute. All right, let's drop it.
Okay, so at this point, what I'm going to do is uh, check the brachial artery blood flow. I'm going to identify the brachial artery, which is right here. Now, uh, just one thing about this patient's history. He had a coronary artery bypass done about a month ago, uh, and no surgeon uh, would have gotten clearance for a fistula placement at this point in time. So this is one of the beautiful things about the percutaneous fistulas, that we can proceed in patients who would otherwise not be surgical candidates. So here we have a blood flow of 735, and uh, we are done with the case. So at this point, once the sheath is out, the sheath comes out real easily and the wire and everything. Basically, you just need gentle pressure with uh, a finger for about three to five minutes uh, for hemostasis, and the patient goes home with a Band-Aid uh, after this. So uh, I can feel a nice thrill under my finger. And if I were to lift my finger, actually, we would have arterial flow or fistula uh, flow through this and blood would be leaking out. 